Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is May 13th. Today in garden history, it was on this day, May 13th in 1815, that Mary Russell Mitford wrote about the changing times in a letter to her friend, Sir William Elford, the English banker, politician, and amateur artist. And in this letter, Mary mentions a bow pot, which is a large ornamental vase for cut flowers. Here's what she wrote. When our grandmothers made a bow pot, every stalk and stem was in its place. Tulip answered tulip, and peony stared at peony. The huge bouquet spread its tremendous width as flat, as stiff, and almost as ugly as its fair framer's painted fan. We, their granddaughters, throw our honeysuckles and posies into their vases with little other care than to produce the grace of nature by its carelessness and profusion. And why should we not? And today we remember Nora Perry, the American poet, newspaper correspondent, and writer. She died on this day, May 13th in 1896. In her poem, What May Be, Nora wrote, When the days are longer, longer, and the sun shines stronger, stronger, and the winds cease blowing, blowing, the winter's chance of snowing is lost in springtime weather. And here's an excerpt from Nora's poem, The Coming of Spring. All this changing tint, this whispering stir, and hint of bud and bloom and wing is the coming of the spring. So silently but swift above the wintry drift, the long days gain and gain until on hill and plain once more and yet once more returning as before, we see the bloom of birth make young again the earth. And today we celebrate the birthday of Enid Annenberg Haupt, the American publisher and philanthropist. She was born on this day, May 13th in 1906. The president of the New York Botanical Garden called Enid the greatest patron American horticulture has ever known. Enid was one of eight children. Her parents, Sadie and Moses, had one son and seven daughters. Her father was the founder of a large publishing empire, and Enid followed in his footsteps and became heiress to the large family fortune. Enid's first marriage ended in divorce, but her second marriage to Ira Haupt launched her philanthropic activities and introduced her to the world of gardening. When they got engaged, Ira gave Enid a Cymbidium orchid. Enid was immediately enthralled by it, and she told Ira that for her wedding present, she would be very happy with a gift of 13 Cymbidium orchids. Enid's brother, Walter, put her in charge of the magazine Seventeen in 1953. And during her tenure, Seventeen magazine was more popular than Glamour and twice as popular as Mademoiselle. At one point, more than half of the teenage girls in America were reading Seventeen magazine. Enid ran the magazine until 1970. When Enid died in 2005, she had donated more than $140 million to charities. Her favorite charities involved gardening. This is how Enid became known as the fairy godmother of American horticulture and the patron saint of public gardens. In 2020, Enid's name and legacy resurfaced in the news when the American Horticultural Society attempted to sell their historic headquarters. The original purchase of this special property was made possible thanks to Enid. After she retired from Seventeen magazine, Enid learned that the Soviet Union was considering purchasing River Farm, the 27-acre property once owned by George Washington as part of his Mount Vernon estate. 
The news was abhorrent to Enid, and in 1973, she ended up donating a million dollars to the American Horticultural Society to buy the property with the stipulation that it would remain open to the public. Well, in November of 2020, the American Horticultural Society attempted to sell River Farm for $32.9 million. The AHS board chair at the time, Terry Hayes, argued that selling River Farm was the only way that the American Hort Society could effectively carry out its national mission of connecting people with plants and to help all Americans learn about sustainable gardening. Well, the unexpected move ended up causing a rift on the board after five board members, Skip Calvert, Tim Conlin, Holly Shimizu, Marsha Zek, and Laura Dowling, argued that it was, quote, not only morally and ethically wrong, but fraught with serious legal issues. A year later, in the fall of 2021, the AHS officially took River Farm off the market. And by then, the board had shrunk down to the five members who had fought to keep the historic property. In a statement, the board said that River Farm will remain as the permanent headquarters of the AHS and as a green space open to the public in honor of Enid Annenberg Haupt, just as she envisioned. And it was on this day, May 13th in 1823, that William Bartram, the American botanist, ornithologist, artist, and explorer, wrote in his diary that there were, quote, numerous tribes of small birds feeding on the aphids on the apple and pear trees and towy buntings building their nests in the garden. In her 2011 book called Vanished Gardens, Finding Nature in Philadelphia, Sharon White summarizes William Bartram's May garden life. She wrote, May was misty sometimes, with a morning wind and cold rains for a week. William said they were injurious to vegetation and to the farmers and to wheat, which was just beginning to ear. It was blasted in many instances, and even young birds drowned in their nests on the ground. Now and then, Bartram's notations look different, smaller script, less detail. On May 6th in 1802, he writes, The green twig whortleberry is in flower. And the next May, he records that a bullfrog swallowed a large mole instantly. And that May, there was a hard frost on the 7th that killed the young shoots of trees and shrubs. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Multifarious Mr. Banks by Toby Musgrave. This book came out in 2020, and the subtitle is from Botany Bay to Q, the natural historian who shaped the world. And Toby Musgrave, the author, is a plant and garden historian, and he is the author or co-author of 18 books, so prolific writer and an expert in garden history. And by the way, in case you're wondering, a multifarious person has many sides or different qualities, and that's certainly true with Joseph Banks. And you can see that in this excerpt from the introduction to this book by Toby Musgrave. He writes, Sir Joseph Banks was only 25 years old when in 1768 he convinced both the prestigious Royal Society and the bureaucratic Admiralty that he should join the HMS Endeavor as the expedition natural historian. He personally paid a fortune to undertake the three-year voyage led by James Cook, and en route became the first European to make an extensive study of the natural history and anthropology of Tahiti, New Zealand, and Australia, and he is said to have had an affair with the Queen of Tahiti, and upon his return, he jilted his fiancée. Later, as a close personal friend of King George III, Banks persuaded the monarch that he was the man to develop the Royal Botanic Garden at Kew. 
And under Bank's leadership, it became the world's leading botanic garden, a position it still holds today. So multifarious indeed. This introduction, by the way, goes on for a couple of pages. So I'm just reading a very small portion of it. But this is an excellent book. If you love garden history and you love biographies, well, then Toby's book is just the thing for you. This book is 386 pages of the biography of Joseph Banks and all he accomplished during his incredible life of adventure and botany. You can get a copy of The Multifarious Mr. Banks by Toby Musgrave and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $39. Finally, we end the show today with a botanic spark that celebrates the birthday of the English author and playwright Daphne du Maurier, who was born on this day, May 13th in 1907. Daphne was the middle daughter of a well-to-do family of creative bohemian artists and writers. Her father was a famous actor and a favorite of James Barry, the author of Peter Pan. Daphne's writing inspired Alfred Hitchcock, especially her novels Rebecca, Jamaica Inn, and her short story The Birds. In 1938, Daphne published her popular book, Rebecca, and it has never gone out of print. During the pandemic in 2020, Netflix released their movie version of Rebecca, starring Lily James from Downton Abbey, and then Army Hammer and Kristen Scott Thomas, one of my favorite actresses. In Rebecca, Daphne writes about the beautiful azaleas that grow on the estate at Manderley, and she writes that the blooms were used to make a perfume for its late mistress. Yet, most azalea growers know that this is likely an example of artistic license, since most evergreen azaleas have little to no fragrance. That said, some native deciduous azaleas can be very fragrant. In the opening pages of Rebecca, Daphne's narrator vividly describes the wild and woolly garden of Manderley. She says, I saw that the garden had obeyed the jungle law, even as the woods had done. The rhododendrons stood 50 feet high, twisted and entwined with bracken, and they had entered into alien marriage with a host of nameless shrubs that clung about their roots as though conscious of their spurious origin. A lilac had mated with a copper beech, and to bind them yet more closely to one another, the malevolent ivy, always an enemy to grace, had thrown her tendrils about the pair and made them prisoners." Daphne du Maurier incorporated gardens into many of her books. Her daughters recall that their mother loved flowers and flower arranging, and their home was always filled with flowers. Yet in her book, The King's General, as in Rebecca, the garden can feel like a dangerous place at times. Here's an excerpt from The King's General. I was a tiny child again at Radford, my uncle's home, and he was walking me through the glass houses in the gardens. There was one flower, an orchid, that grew alone. It was the color of pale ivory, with one little vein of crimson running through the petals. The scent filled the house, honeyed and sickly sweet. It was the loveliest flower I had ever seen. I stretched out my hand to stroke the soft velvet sheen, and swiftly my uncle pulled me by the shoulder. Don't touch it, child. The stem is poisonous. Well, that's it for today's show. A little Daphne du Maurier to take you into the weekend. I hope you get to spend some time in the garden, and I hope the weather cooperates. Just a reminder that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link over at the website or 
in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Oh,